It is the soul of Reverend Brian Hessian that stands out most in the few scattered remnants of his legacy. A faded photograph here. A tattered correspondence there. A yellowed newspaper clipping. A roll of 8mm film. His faded image on a long forgotten television show. A Hollywood movie from the golden era. An aged pamphlet about cancer. A weathered book in a charity shop. A fragment of his voice hidden behind the static of a BBC radio show. And he bearing his cross went forth. Reverend Hessian is in many ways a puzzle box with only a couple of pieces left in it. But in those few remaining pieces, the soul of Reverend Brian Hessian is striking, relevant. Perhaps Reverend Hessian summed up his life best in a few simple words scrawled messily on the front page of a book above an autograph that no one would recognise today. Whatever our problems in life, never let them lick you. He journeyed from a small London suburb all the way to Hollywood and back again, never deviating from his mission, sometimes battling for God, sometimes battling for his life. But in the beginning, he was just another kid in Hendon. The London borough of Hendon was quite a place to be in the pre-war era of the early 20th century. Ascendant and hopeful, the area would soon become a hub of the aviation industry, home to Hendon Aerodrome and eventually the Royal Air Force air displays and pageants that made the newsreels, led forward by the renowned aviation pioneer Claude Graham White. Claude Graham White was certainly a showman. He was a fan of speed, basically. So naturally, when the aeroplane became available as a new form of entertainment and a new form of thrill, he turned his attention to those. He was a visionary. He could see how best to exploit this new medium of aviation. The possibilities were endless and they were everywhere. In 1909, Brian Hessian was born into this cacophony of hard-working dreams and idealistic aspirations. His parents, Colin and Ida Hessian, found a home in nearby Golders Green and settled down to start a family. Brian's father, Colin, made good money as a merchant, trading goods with China, often travelling to Shanghai to do so. He learned Chinese culture and Chinese phrases and words, and perhaps even brought a sense of internationalism into the household. Brian's mother, Ida, took care of the home and the general finance of the household, bringing in boarders and easily making ends meet. Along with Brian's older son, Roy, in turn-of-the-century London, life in Hendon was treating the Hessians well. In 1914, though, the world turned to war and life stopped treating anyone well. And as the war ground stubbornly on, Brian's father applied for admission to the regular army, seeking a temporary commission until the end of the war. He specifically requested admission to the tank corps, which was not an assignment for the faint-hearted. Colin was granted his request and entered the officer's training corps. In April of 1918, he saw action in the tank corps, but was returned to training for further instruction. Even though the tank battles were still fiercely raging, in October 1918 he was moved to the Chinese Labour Corps, perhaps because his background travelling to China was a good resource there, or possibly the tank corps was just too much for him. It was extremely noisy coming from the engine, extremely loud noises coming from the battlefield. It, the heat would be stifling. It would be difficult to concentrate, let alone perform any sensible function within the vehicle of some of the officers actually walking out of their tanks after a battle and committing suicide. Such was the horrible state they found themselves in. In November 1918, armistice was declared. Three months later, Colin Hessian was discharged from the army on a 4A status, regular discharge. In a perfect world, Colin would have returned to his home at St John's Road in Golders Green in the shadow of the aerodrome and moved on chasing his post-war dream. But like so many soldiers returning from the Great War, the post-war dream proved elusive to Colin Hessian. Grandfather had an unmentionable illness and I wasn't uh, told about the cause of his death until I was a uh, first, second year medical student. Um, so this was a skeleton in the family cupboard, at, but he wasn't alone in uh, coming back from China with uh, a disease which was prevalent amongst uh, the ladies of, uh, well, anyway, 
They were prostitutes, obviously, I'm trying to think of a better word, but the disease did progress to the, the third stage. Um, we hardly ever see it now, GPI, general paralysis of the insane or tertiary syphilis. General paralysis of the insane was what many historians now understand to be neurosyphilis. So this is the final stage of untreated syphilis, which can occur anywhere between 10 and 15 years after the initial syphilitic infection. The symptoms of general paralysis were very varied and they were both mental and physical. So people would be confused, they might have particular delusions, particular hallucinations, but they also had very marked physical symptoms like uh, tremors, fits, uh, unable to walk properly and as the disease progressed, as the, um, the, the name suggests, general paralysis, they would become less and less able to actually be involved with any kind of physical activity. So many patients would end their days simply laid in an asylum bed, usually. But in the first instance, um, the symptoms um, weren't that different from um, a, a regular asylum lunatic, uh, if you like. I mean, the, the symptoms of um, classic madness. General paralysis was something that you could often link to various things at once. So you might say that a patient's general paralysis was caused by their hereditary disposition, but that might also interact with a physical injury. What you often see in some of the records is that general paralysis is attributed to um, an amalgamation of causes. So you could say that it was brought on by a physical injury like a head injury mm. and, and that acted as a catalyst. It was generally a very stigmatised um, diagnosis. There was a whole sort of moral sort of, um, you know, armoury behind it. After the war, Collins' mental and physical condition deteriorated and as his situation became more dire, he was admitted to the Knapsbury Mental Asylum. There were many families in the UK that found themselves after the war suddenly confronted with the challenges of this sort of mental illness. While GPI was slowly becoming more widely recognised as a biological ailment, not simply madness, the public and the military administrators could be less than sympathetic. And the idea that, that stress or life circumstances uh, uh, um, had anything to do with it was um, derided as uh, the traditional position was that it was the, uh, the fault of the, uh, of the individual. But um, there was a school of thought, a medical school of thought, which produced evidence that um, stress of battle or stress in other circumstances um, could play a role in, in triggering um, um, GPI. Um, I, one doesn't want to exaggerate this and say that it altogether lost its stigma, but uh, alternative positions were, um, were, were, were given a hearing. Horrendous uh, stigma, particularly uh, for a normal middle-class family. Um, it was totally unmentionable. It was uh, uh, indicative of uh, sin and uh, shame and uh, did... Uh, die uh, in the hospital, unknown and unseen by his children. Asylums were still very scary places. Mm. I'm not saying that um, children would have been um, forbidden to enter, but they certainly wouldn't have been, uh, been encouraged. In April 1922, Second Lieutenant Colin Hessian passed away at Knapsbury Mental Hospital at the age of 42, marked defective with his cause of death listed as general paralysis of the insane, many months. Another sad ghost story left to haunt the streets and back alleys of London. As he lay dying in Knapsbury, Colin swore to his wife Ida that he left her a soldier's will, implying that there were untold riches left behind for her. Ida wrote letters to the military, but no soldier's will for Colin Hessian was ever found. Perhaps just another delusion suffered by a dying soldier in the painful grips of GPI things must have seemed bleak to Brian. Nevertheless, life would soon prove that even profound obstacles would not deter young Brian from following his dreams with a biblical tenacity. In some ways, post-war Hendon made the perfect stomping ground for a rebellious youth like Brian Hessian. Home to the first air displays hosted annually by the victorious Royal Air Force, including a massive war victory display in 1919 when Brian was just 10 years old. Living within walking distance of the airfield must have been inspiring to Brian, 
Self-described as anti-God at the time and the young son of a widowed mother, Brian was filled with mischief and there were plenty of places to find it. He was educated first at the renowned St John's School Leatherhead and later attended the prestigious Ordinum School where he specialised perhaps more in dissent than study. If you read accounts of boys and men looking back on their time at British public schools in the 19th and 20th century, it's absolutely mind-boggling and it's really tragic, um, the, both for the mothers and fathers and the young boys being sent away to a boarding school and they're not supposed to cry and their mother's not supposed to cry and they're not supposed to be upset or show any pain or weakness. And you read these school stories from the 19th and 20th century um, of this, really to my very sensitive modern eyes, incredibly brutal institutions uh, where you were taught the classic kind of cliches about men, boys don't show their feelings, boys don't cry. Uh, this was the attitude. And, and there are many people who look back on their, their time there um, with some <laughs> Uh, pain, I think. But at the age of 14, Brian and his older brother Roy attended Christian camp in Dorset during the school holidays, sponsored by the Children's Special Service Mission. A free camp, these were the only kind of trips away their mother could afford. The camps were small and heavily focused on Christianity, but Brian enjoyed them, mostly because it was time away from boarding school. This is where he first met Bishop John Taylor Smith. Bishop Taylor Smith had spent years in Africa as Bishop of Sierra Leone, a witness to classic British colonialism. He was later named as Bishop for the UK's armed forces, serving as Chaplain General over the entire British military during World War I. He struggled immensely to find enough chaplains to assist in easing the pain of the massive amounts of frightened, injured or dying soldiers. He was no stranger to pain and grief and death. For years, the bishop participated in the camps arranged by the Children's Special Service Mission, coordinating outings with young people, many of whom had lost their fathers in the war and were surviving difficult post-war years. It was at these camps that the two Hessian boys were meaningfully exposed to sports and participated in water polo, winning championships and building confidence. The effect of Bishop John Taylor Smith on Brian Hessian was substantial and long-lasting in many ways. The bishop never wrote any books himself, but became somewhat renowned for observations and witticisms that he used in conversation and scrawled in the personal Bible that he carried with him throughout his life. Upon his death, the bishop left his Bible to one of his students, Percy O'Roof, who compiled and published some of these observations in two separate books that drew significant public interest at the time. Yet it's the actual pages of the bishop's Bible itself that reflect the texture of the bishop's words, the detailed notes, the carefully drawn fingers pointing out this text or that. Without writing a biography, the bishop's Bible itself in its marginalia leaves behind a clear picture of the bishop's philosophy and teachings. For example, Proverbs 6.22 reads, When thou goest, it shall lead thee, and when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee, and when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. In the border next to this, Bishop Taylor Smith wrote his own impressions from this verse. God's law, to help when conscious, unconscious and semi-conscious. And in the book of Daniel, when Daniel has a vision of four horned creatures visiting him, he does not hesitate to ask who they are and what they mean. Bishop Taylor Smith admired this intellectual curiosity, noting that It is our duty to inquire and search for that which we do not understand. Brian Hessian was slowly becoming determined to live a life that unequivocally demonstrated the way in which he interpreted Bishop Taylor Smith's words. Regardless of one's circumstances, it is a godly duty to inquire. It is a godly duty to search for what we do not understand. Building on the lessons he learned from Bishop Taylor Smith, Brian Hessian, in his final years at Aldenham, found himself drawn to the clergy, a path his older brother Roy would eventually also follow. The appeal of the church to her children did not altogether please their mother. A widow's son going to be a parson is ridiculous. There's no money in it. Nevertheless, in chasing his dreams and aspirations, in time Brian would prove to be, above all, tenacious, whether he had money or not. In the early 20th century, I think it was perfectly possible to feel that it was a move upwards if you came from a modest background. And the church at large, as a social organisation, was very conscious of class, background, education 
and those other properties, there was a strong sense that the Church of England did represent the established religion, and therefore to be a priest of such a church represented a move, one might say, into the centre of society, because everyone lives in a parish, and there is a priest for each parish, or there largely is in this period, and therefore it's not simply a question of whether you're moving up, it's a question of whether you're moving into the centre, whether you're in a sense becoming a public presence. Your home was a place in which people came for meetings, private life was in many ways rather difficult to maintain, and many parish priests would find that they automatically hobnobbed with the higher levels of society around them because they were recognisable to them. Brian worked hard at school and earned a scholarship to Christ's College, Cambridge. He entered a privileged world of the rich and brilliant, a million miles away from the struggles of Hendon. In some way, perhaps, that's what Brian felt he needed, a fresh start, a new beginning. It's exactly what he got. In the autumn of 1928, Brian Hessian travelled to Cambridge where he began his studies in earnest. He performed well and in 1931 he earned his Bachelor of Arts in History with honours. In 1932 he attended Clifton Theological College in Bristol and was ordained in 1933. He returned to Cambridge and earned his MA in 1935. During these years, the young Brian Hessian continued working with the Children's Special Service Mission, working as a youth leader at beach and skiing outings, like the ones he'd attended a few years earlier. He advocated the concept of open confessions and became a leader of the movement at Cambridge, a sportsman with a spiritual side. He was a member of the prestigious Cambridge University Swimming and Water Polo Club, as well as the captain of the Christ's College Swim Club, where he also played water polo, averaging a point a game during his tenure. Hessian also served as the Honorary Assistant Treasurer and Assistant Secretary of the Cambridge University Swim Club. Hessian appears to have introduced a series of somewhat grandiose resolutions. These included a great gala in the summer that was to include star celebrities performing, such as Olympian swimmer Joyce Cooper and the prestigious Travelling Mermaid Club. He proudly and boldly signed his name to this unique set of resolutions. Notably, in the entire Cambridge University Swim Club Minutes book, not a single other resolution was ever noted by any other secretary. Hessian's proud resolve was unique in that regard. Even in his youth, Hessian was showing signs of his character as an ambitious showman, regardless of the norms and regardless of the consequences, which proved to come quickly. Hessian's tenure as secretary lasted less than six weeks when a new secretary was elected at an ad hoc meeting immediately prior to the popular Oxford-Cambridge match the following month. While one can only speculate, it's not hard to imagine that Hessian's impulsive introduction of major resolutions may have ruffled some feathers. There is no record of Hessian's participating in any further swim club events. While at Cambridge, Brian took courses on medical skills with the thought that such skills could be helpful should he choose to participate in missionary work abroad. Many of these lectures concluded with a film presentation of a medical procedure for instructive purposes. The sessions were wildly popular with overflowing crowds and immediately sparked Brian's first interest in film. It was a love affair that would last the rest of his life. In 1933, Hessian became a curate at St Margaret's Church, Lee, in South London. Serving in the Victorian church and surrounded by the graves of the wealthy and intellectual, including three astronomers royal, one of whom, Edmund Halley, must have had a particular influence on Brian. Edmund Halley was famous for what's called Halley's Comet now, and uh, he had to travel to the southern hemisphere to work this out. Uh, he travelled there really quite young and uh, he quit his time in Oxford, the university where he was, and because, uh, I don't know, he became a bit, a bit unhappy with his time there and it didn't quite work out for him so he kind of left and said I'm going to do my own thing and off he went to the southern hemisphere and uh, tracked various planets uh, and, you know, astro bodies. Uh, and eventually came up with uh, quite a long thesis, quite a complicated thesis about the movements of planets and uh, sent it back to the king. So bypassed the system, really, uh, whereupon the king said, give that man a master's. But there were more than just the ghosts of greatness past that would influence Brian at St Margaret's. The vicar of St Margaret's during Hessian's curate years was Canon Frank Gillingham, 
Well, he was rector here for uh, in a pre a period pre-war, um, and I think through the war time as well, um, and became really quite uh, well known as a preacher as much as anything uh, in in the church here. Uh, so this place would be filled with you know 600 people <laughs> at one service, and then that would finish, and another you know couple of hundred people be waiting outside ready to come in for the next one. So he had this reputation um, about him. Uh, I mean, the other reputation he had was as a cricketer. <laughs> uh, and he was the first one to uh, give the cricket commentary on radio for test cricket in this country. So that's quite a little sort of uh, achievement, you could say. That's all in addition to his being a rector of the church. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the kind of folk lore of uh, English church history, you know, cricket and, <laughs> and the church and clerics sometimes are kind of put together, uh, and he would be a starring example of that. It was at this time that Hessian formed the Night Film Club, his first foray into the new medium of cinema, hosting evenings of religious films and attracting a younger audience to the church. Gillingham had made a lasting impact on Brian. He had finally found his voice. Moreover, Brian's life was changing in other ways. He began to date Joyce Cooper, the young Olympic swimmer who he'd hoped would appear at a Cambridge Swim Club gala. By this time, Miss Cooper was a star in her own right, and her celebrity status was so high that it earned her a place in the newsreels. Well, it's a great race, and I can hardly say how pleased I am to have won it. Because they were regarded at the time as a bit of a celebrity, uh, glamorous couple. Um, and I think they've probably featured in the press quite a bit at the time and uh, probably in Tatler and so forth. Brian seemed to be a kindred spirit to Joyce. She herself was an outspoken dissenter from the beginning, decrying various Olympic rules and the manner in which the UK Olympic team was treated. The relationship between Hessian and Cooper grew more serious. Soon the Daily Mirror announced their engagement on its front page. Again, it looked as though Brian was closing in on his dream, but it was not to be, not on this path at least. The newspapers would soon announce that by May 1934, Joyce Cooper was engaged to another man, John Badcock, a well-known rugby player for Oxford University and an Olympic medalist. The two went on to have a son and Joyce retired from swimming. She took it up again a few years later and found herself missing the competition. Nevertheless, it was not to be. Decades later, Cooper would reminisce on her regrets that she ended her swimming career prematurely. I went down to London and thought I was swimming faster than I had ever done. One day, two French girls in the swimming world said it is criminal. You are much faster than when you were beating the best. Of course, I would have liked to have found out for myself, but my husband didn't like it. Such is the way of dreams. Some are left behind with tinges of regret, others are chased forever. By this time it was already clear that Brian Hessian was a determined dream chaser. The stigma around a broken engagement might have slowed down anyone at that time. As Reverend Hessian noted years later, the clammy evil imaginings of the depressed mind in the middle of the night are hard to shake off and remind me of the fungus which hangs from the trees in the swamps of Louisiana. Only those who have experienced the evil and dark flights of fancy in the mind can understand the devastating effect that they can have on our happiness. But Brian Hessian was not one to allow darkness to slow him down. By the next year, he had met a new woman, Mary Scar, known to her friends and family as Molly. The two began to see each other, and Brian never looked back. The promise of a new and open road lay ahead of them. In the early 1930s, the Church of England was beginning to take serious note of the film industry, Brian Hessian's great passion. It saw the potential value of the medium in a religious context, but did not seem to fully understand it. It was concerned about the possible negative effects on the morals of England, but also seemed to be aware of its power and wondered whether it should attempt to control it, utilise it, or both. I think in the 1930s and 40s, uh, there was a lot of scepticism by the church, which is why you had the production code, you had the Hayes Office code, you had the Catholic Legion of Decency. You had a sense that the church needed to control 
uh, what filmmakers were doing. That, where it was thought that the cinema was competing with, competing for the souls of, uh, of um, as it was often thought in a lot of the literature uh, at the time, um, you know, gullible people. The cinema was going to uh, corrupt the mindset particularly of uh, younger people. You even had a, a papal encyclical from 1936, which was an attempt to try and say, well, we need to ensure that films are good and wholesome. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Cosmo Lang in particular, was interested in the possibility of some kind of national film committee that not only participated in the substance and, where necessary, censorship, but was also involved in finding and endorsing films that it considered appropriate. Cosmo Gordon Lang, who was born in 1864, was someone who, in this period, was making his way rather cautiously through the new landscapes of the middle 20th century, and sometimes doing so reluctantly. So he's not in many ways a natural innovator in the areas in which um, Brian Hessian finds himself. But of course he exercises a considerable um, superintending presence as far as the life of the church itself is concerned. I think the important thing to say about Lang is that he's complex, he's sophisticated, he's extremely bright, he's very aware of what's going on around him. He has quite an idealistic, even a romantic sense of justice, though often it seems in the period in which we're looking to be rather depleted and even slightly sceptical. He's not, not automatically um, unhappy with innovations, and he's not actually aut automatically unhappy with the cinema as a medium or the idea of introducing the works of the theatre to the life of the church. The church set a date, May the 17th, 1935, to host the first official meeting between the church under an umbrella title that would be known as the Cinema Christian Council, which had been initially started two years earlier but put on hiatus because of lack of consensus on too many issues. Lang's goal was to change this. The influence of the church in British public life in this period is very considerable indeed and in many respects fundamental. One only has to look at the early history of an organisation like the BBC to see that religion is given a tremendously important place within the development of its programmes and its priorities. And it was in this atmosphere, where no one had quite yet agreed to what the church's role in film should be, that Brian Hessian, still a young and determined curate, caught word of the impending meeting in May 1935 and immediately concluded that he knew the proper role of the church in film and that religious films and film strips were the future. Well, I, I remember Brian as, as a filmmaker and uh, he got me quite interested. He was producing this material uh, in the name of Dawn Trust. He would send me these little uh, capsules with, uh, for a ten-year-old, were quite exciting to see these, pull out these strips of 35 millimeter film and look at them in the, in the light. And uh, they were quite envied at my school because nobody else had anything quite like uh, this. The idea was so perfect, in fact, that Brian Hessian skipped every level of bureaucratic scrutiny and went straight to the top, the Archbishop of Canterbury himself. Writing on a letterhead from the Knights Film Club, St Margaret's Lee, and identifying himself as a curate to the well-known Reverend Gillingham, a young Hessian claimed in his letter that he had been asked by the Bishop of Croydon to help on the film committee and Brian requested a personal meeting with the Archbishop himself, going so far as to offer to bring a projector to show the Archbishop his own films. However, the correspondence ended up not with the Archbishop, but with his deputy chaplain, Alan Don. Alan Don was Archbishop Lang's chaplain and secretary, and he served Lang devotedly for much of his primacy. But I think somebody like Alan Don would have seen that he represented something of a filter between the Archbishop and the world, and Lang himself would have used Alan Don in exactly that way. So the place of Don in the equation is to help Lang find the right sources of information and secure the most responsible sources of advice. Of course, Don's own opinions will be part of that mix, but the role of Don in the equation was not to be an expert, certainly not to be a guru of any kind, but to help Lang put together essentially an empirical method that drew from recognisable sources of authority and achieved the right view. Chaplain Don did not appear pleased with Brian's blatant breach of the church's protocol, going over the head of the entire church bureaucracy to address the archbishop directly. 
The Archbishop of Canterbury has received your letter of May 3rd. He is afraid that he has not a moment of time between now and May 17. The meeting of May 17th is of a preliminary nature and your name was not one of those suggested by the Bishop of Croydon for that occasion. What Brian probably did not know is that the Bishop of Croydon had already recommended that the Archbishop extend an invitation to the committee to the Reverend Gilbert Shaw, which had been accepted. It would not be the last time Shaw ascended to a position coveted by Brian. Well, Gilbert Shaw is a significant figure in his own day, but in many ways he's significant as a, an example of Christian social conscience, an interest in the work of religious orders, a heightened and expressive relationship with Christian spirituality, as it might be found on paper and in books. So he's one of those very creative individualists at work within the general fabric of the Church of England in this period. He doesn't have an immense reputation, he doesn't have a high office, but he's very much a public presence. Nevertheless, Brian seemed to move on. He soon married Molly and in September 1935 joined the Royal Air Force on a short service commission. He would serve as a squadron leader and chaplain near London in the RAF unit at Halton but was never assigned any overseas duty. Life refused to remain calm or tranquil for Brian. In mid-1936, while driving his car near Halton, Brian hit and killed a motorcyclist who was riding without lights or a helmet. According to a witness, the rider, who had only one eye, had not stopped or looked before running through an intersection, causing his motorcycle combination to collide with Brian's car. An inquest was held and Brian was not charged. The verdict was death by misadventure. The incident had a serious impact on the Reverend, however. Within two months, he'd resigned his commission with the RAF and accepted a position as vicar to a parish in Aylesbury at Holy Trinity, Walton, starting in the first weeks of 1937. Soon, Reverend Hessian was named chaplain to the mayor of Aylesbury and was quickly becoming well known in his new home. Yes, Reverend Brian Hessian was one of the ministers here. He came in 1937, so the church was nearly 100 years old then, and he stayed for 13 years. He didn't leave until 1950. He left a great impression with the people he ministered to. It was very much a, let's get to know everybody and then we won't have any strangers. <laughs> At his new church, the Reverend Hessian almost immediately continued his quest to develop and grow a congregation through the medium of film. In his very first week, he held a church social gathering that included a film presentation of his wedding to his wife, Mary, as well as other local footage that he'd shot, as an example of how the church would begin to incorporate film into its services and philosophy. Soon enough, Reverend Hessian would be showing full-length talkie films to his congregation, films which had been approved by the church as suitable and with sound moral teachings, such as The Passing of the Third Floor Back. He sometimes rented out public theatres in Aylesbury and surrounding areas, drawing large crowds as well as attention from the media. He certainly toured the country with a projector and a screen. Uh, I mean, it's small beer nowadays, but it, he would uh, set up in a church and every night for three or four nights would people that hadn't seen a great big screen in the church before. The town would get plastered with posters and uh, he would give an introduction and a talk uh, before and after the film. So, uh, yes, I made several trips from my boarding school to this church in Ramsgate to see him doing his uh, stuff, where I met my first girlfriend. <laughs> Wendy Smith, whatever happened to her. But, <laughs> no, I, I just remember sort of going to sing and uh, holding hands, which was a very exciting thing for a, a young boy at that stage, was uh, Wendy Smith, yes. In many ways, Reverend Hessian seemed to be modelling his career trajectory after famed British film mogul Arthur Rank. J. Arthur Rank realised how difficult it is to communicate uh, and he set up um, uh, a Sunday evening club for children to attend, which involved music and, among other things, showing films. But he found that when the children were watching the films, they would sit still and engage in a way that they didn't when he was teaching them in Sunday school. So he became very interested in the film industry. And within 10 years, 
He owned studios, cinemas and distribution rights, totalling uh, £50 million. Pounds. Um, and he had great uh, influence in every area uh, of the business. Such a success story must have been inspiring to the young reverend. Meanwhile, the Cinema Christian Council was not progressing as Archbishop Lang had hoped. While Hessian's films were attracting larger and larger congregations, the council began to look for new members, and in March 1937, the tenacity that had characterised Hessian from his lean days in Hendon paid off. He was finally accepted onto the council, the very church organisation that Alan Don had scooted him away from in 1935. In his eyes, at least, he was now approaching the same heights as Gilbert Shaw and even Arthur Rank. And there was no reason to believe that the Reverend's trajectory was headed anywhere but upwards. He did not wait long to take advantage of his new membership. Just a month after becoming a member of the council, Reverend Hessian wrote directly again to the Archbishop of Canterbury. He introduced himself as a member of the council and invited the Archbishop to a sermon in which a full-length talky film would be shown. Furthermore, Reverend Hessian asked the Archbishop to give the service his blessing, as well as a written commendation that could be published. He also requested that the Archbishop say a few words at one of the services. The Council itself heard of Reverend Hessian's request and forwarded its thoughts to Chaplain Don, as articulated by the Council's secretary, T. H. Baxter. It is proposed to hold a religious film festival at the Metropole Cinema on June the 6th, 13th and 20th. The Reverend Brian Hessian, who I think you know of old, is a very impulsive young man whom we are trying to keep in hand and make use of his energy and enthusiasm. Because the event had already been advertised and many people had accepted invitations, the council had little choice but to pass resolutions to approve the showing or risk angering Reverend Hessian's growing audience. But it was clear that the council was losing patience with Hessian's growing tendency to act first and beg forgiveness second. Baxter and the council were intent on tamping down at least one of the Reverend Hessian's plans. Hessian turns up with some printed notepaper. And I wonder how far you feel it would be right to put the Archbishop of Canterbury's name on this effort. It is also proposed to send out an invitation card on which we shall say... The Archbishop of Canterbury requests the pleasure of your attendance at a religious film service, etc. Or rather, I suggest it should be the Cinema Christian Council, etc. But Hessian says that's not enough. Not unexpectedly, Chaplain Don was firm and unequivocal in his response. No. In no uncertain terms, Chaplain Don responded to the reverence requests to both the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Council quite simply. As to the specific requests which you made in your letter of April the 7th, His Grace is afraid that he cannot comply with any of them. But Brian Hessian had not yet gone as far as he could with his evangelical campaign for the widespread distribution of religious film. After he'd been on the council for barely three months, in May and June 1937, Reverend Hessian sent two correspondences directly to Queen Mary herself, seeking her patronage for his film company Dawn Trust. After all, if Edmund Halley could approach the King directly 200 years earlier, Reverend Hessian could surely approach the Queen directly now. Queen Mary seemed somewhat befuddled by Hessian, and Buckingham Palace sought guidance from the Archbishop of Canterbury on the matter, who promptly delegated it to Chaplain Don. Don remained unamused with Reverend Hessian's bravado and disinterest in proper church protocol. In his response, Chaplain Don reflected on the Reverend Hessian's character. In the Archbishop of Canterbury's opinion, Mr Hessian is to be commended for his enthusiasm and enterprise. At the same time, the matter is still in a more or less experimental stage, and he does not think that it would be advisable for Her Majesty the Queen to be identified with it until it has been put to further test. While those statements would surely have settled the matter with Buckingham Palace, Chaplain Don felt it appropriate to provide one more comment on Brian, stating... As for Mr Hessian himself, he is an enthusiastic and somewhat pushing young man, and His Grace does not think it would be altogether good for him to have Her Majesty's patronage until he has given proof being the kind of man who thoroughly merits encouragement in high quarters. No further talks between Buckingham Palace and the Reverend appear to have occurred, for the time being at least. <laughs> 